Hi, I'm Pastor Darren Stroh from First Baptist Church of Lamar, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to study with us. We're continuing our study of the first chapter of the book of James. Today's goal really is to try to hit five through eight, um, but I want to begin reading today with verse one. James chapter one, beginning in verse one, reads this way. From James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are scattered outside the land of Israel, greetings. My brothers and sisters, Think of the various tests you encounter as occasions for joy. After all, you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let this endurance complete its work, so that you may be fully mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. But anyone who needs wisdom should ask God, whose very nature is to give to everyone without a second thought, without keeping score. Wisdom will certainly be given to those who ask. Whoever asks shouldn't hesitate. They should ask in faith without doubting. Whoever doubts is like the waves of the sea tossed and turned by the wind. People like that should never imagine that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded, unstable in all their ways. Would you pray with me? Grant us, O Lord, to know you, to love you, and to rejoice in you. And if we cannot do these things perfectly in this life, let us at least grow in higher degrees every day until we can realize the knowledge, the love, and the joy that you have fully intended for us. Let our knowledge of you increase in us here that we may be fuller there. Let our love for you grow every day more and more here that it may be perfected when we join you there. And may our joy be great in itself and full in you. We know that you are the God of truth. And all of those gracious promises that you have made to us, we ask that you honor those as you always have and you always will. To you be the glory and the honor, you who are with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and live and reign as one holy triune God forevermore. Amen. A story is told about a CEO. CEO of a company that actually is kind of in trouble. <laughs> I picked this slide because I like this guy's haircut. But even before this whole COVID crisis hits, the company was floundering with purpose and with vision and even with their finances. Now that this COVID thing had hit, all of their margins were gone. Company stocks were dropping in value. Layoffs seemed imminent. This was the first time that this CEO looked at his board and saw panic. So he decided to do something that he had never done before. He asked everyone there in the boardroom to bow their heads and that he would pray. It's time to ask God what to do next, he said. One by one, each board member reluctantly bowed their heads and the CEO went on to pray. As soon as the CEO said amen, an angel showed up right there in the boardroom. The angel looked at the CEO and said, because you look to God for guidance here, I've been authorized to grant you one of three possible wishes. I can either grant you wisdom, I can grant you riches, I can even grant you good looks. <laughs> Looks like this guy might need it. Without missing a beat, the CEO said, I'll take wisdom. The angel nodded approvingly and then suddenly just disappeared. The boardroom went silent for what seemed to be an eternity. Finally, one of the older board members boldly began to speak up. Well, are you wiser? Oh, yes, said the CEO. Well, then say something. Let us in on this wisdom that you've received. After a few seconds, the CEO as he looked around at each one at the table, he finally offered this wisdom. Hmm, I think I probably should have gone for the riches. Oh, wisdom. That's what we're going to be talking about today. What exactly is wisdom? Well, wisdom is different than knowledge. Knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is how you apply it. My grandmother used to use this, this analogy. Knowledge is knowing the tomatoes are fruit. Wisdom is knowing better than to put it in a fruit salad. Knowledge is necessary for wisdom, 
but wisdom is really how things work. Another one said, wisdom is the quality that you use so that in the end you don't end up having to use it. Um, wisdom is knowledge properly applied. Let me see if I can give you an example here. Let's say you look in your bank account and you see that uh, the, the Treasury Department has deposited your COVID-19 stimulus check. You've got $1,200. You look at your thing, it tells you $1,200. You now know you have $1,200. Well, there's some other things that you know too. You know that your car is in desperate need of repair. You also know that there are parts of your house that desperately need some, some work as well. You also know that you don't have any money in the savings account and that, you know, if you ended up getting sick or something, that you'd have nothing to pay your co-pays or your co-insurances or your deductibles or anything like that. And on top of all of that, you also know that this thing that you have been wanting for the last 25 years is now on sale because you've gotten 17 emails reminding you that it is now on sale and in limited supply. Those are all the kinds of things you know. You know you've got the money, you know you've got needs, you know you've got wants. Wisdom is how you take the money and you apply it to the things in a way that works out for the best possible outcome. That's wisdom. Here's the problem with wisdom. If you want to come to a wise outcome, you need to know all of the variables. Now, we can, we can act wisely to a degree because we can learn from past mistakes and we can learn from past patterns and we can watch others and, and as they make mistakes, we can figure out how not to do that. Um, but that is only partial wisdom. If we really want to be wise in what we do all the time, we really need to know the whole picture. Which means I have to know what the future holds in order for me to make a wise decision today. Let me explain. Got that COVID check. I got $1,200. I decide that I'm going to put it in the bank because, you know, I don't want to get, if, if I get sick, I want to make sure that there's money to take care of that. So I put the money in the bank and I make my way to Denver because I have to go to Denver for something. And halfway between here and Lyman, my car breaks down and, and it's dead, dead on arrival. It's sitting on the side of the road and it, it's not going to move any further. Money in the bank. And I bet now that my car has got far more than $1,200 worth of repairs in it. Did I make the wise choice by putting the money in the bank? Well, the answer is no. Change the scenario around. I recognize that my car needs work, so I put all of my money, all that $1,200 in my car, and the next morning that I get up, I go into the kitchen, and the floor of the kitchen falls out, falls to the basement. Now, a $1,200 jack and pole and all that kind of stuff could have held it up, but I chose to put it in the car instead, and now... Not only do we need a jetpack to pop popcorn in the microwave, it's going to cost a lot more than $1,200 to fix my kitchen, right? So did I make the wise choice of putting it into my car? No. Um, see how I need to know the whole picture for wisdom to be 100% accurate? I put part of it into my car and part of it into my house and part of it into my savings and my car breaks down, my car, my house falls apart and I end up in the hospital. I haven't solved anything by even trying to spread it out a little bit, even though that might have seemed wise. In the end, I really needed to know the outcome to know how to act wisely today. And therein lies the problem with wisdom. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I may know who holds tomorrow, but I don't know what tomorrow holds. How can I act wisely? I think of the people that James is writing to here. They've been displaced. Um, they've been run out of town. They've been terrorized, and they've moved to places where they don't know the language. They don't know what's going on. 
They don't know if there's a job for them or not. They just find the place, they, they settle down, and then they start asking these kinds of questions that really need to know what the future holds. Like, are we ever going to be able to go back? Because that's going to depend, you know, do I buy a house, do I rent? Um, do I settle in here? Do I create roots here? Or do we just try to hold out for a little bit? Um, how, how long is this going to last? the people that James is writing to. Do I try to start my own business or do I try to find a job with somebody else? Do I try to find a job that is going to, you know, force me to learn a new skill or am I going to, should I try to start something with something that I already know, even if there's really not a high demand for it? How do I make decisions about how to take care of my family, how to take care of myself? How do I do that when I don't know the future? How do I make friends who are Christians? Because if I make a wrong move and start talking to people like they are Christians when they're not, well, is that evangelism or was that stupidity because I might have to move again? These are tough questions. And really, honestly, to act wisely, you really do need to know the outcome of it before you can act wisely in every situation. Doesn't that apply to us today? I mean, who saw this coming? And yeah, there's some speeches out there 10, 15 years ago that said we should be paying attention to this. But, but seriously, if somebody stopped you on Thanksgiving of last year and said, you need to be prepared to hunker down in your home for the next for, for three, four months, maybe five months, maybe two years, you need to be prepared to live extraordinarily differently than you do today. Would you have taken them seriously on Thanksgiving? And if so, how on earth would you have prepared wisely? Because even then you had no clue as to what's going on or what would take place. And honestly, do we know what's going to happen tomorrow? Do we know what's going to happen the next day? I sent a letter out today to um, the leadership of our church asking the question, when it is time for us to be able to open our doors again and allow people to come back in for worship, what is that going to look like? How are we going to do that? And are there steps that we need to take that are different than what they were four or five months ago? How are we going to manage these changes. And then as I was writing it, I was actually kind of laughing to myself because when this whole thing began around Easter time, we had plan A and then the rules changed and the you know governor's directives changed. So we came up with plan B and then they changed again. And so now we went to plan C. And then as we talked about plan C, we realized plan C probably wasn't a good idea. So we came up with plan D and plan E just in case plan D didn't work. That's a lot of planning. And largely because we didn't know how to act wisely because we didn't know what the future held. This is the world that we live in. God calls us to act wisely. How do we do that? You know, last week we talked about considering it pure joy when we go through various trials. And, and all of that talked about how God is using our circumstances to grow us, to change us, to make us a little bit more like his son. Um, to, to create that endurance so that we may mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And that whole first couple of verses, the first four verses there, talks about how God is working in us. The big question mark that I end up after the end of verse 4 is, okay, what do I do? How do I make this work? I really honestly believe that God isn't a God who just wants us to sit back on the couch and let him do everything. He wants to enjoy this journey with us. He wants to connect with us and engage with us. So what's my part in all of this? Other than to be still and know that he is God. What's my part in the endurance game? What's my part in the allowing that endurance to become full and mature and complete and not lacking in anything? How do I do? How do I, what do I do so that when God is working, 
I'm making wise choices in joining him in his work. How do I get wise? Well, the answer to that is actually pretty simple. James tells us the answer to this. Anyone who needs wisdom should ask God, whose very nature is to give to everyone without a second thought and without keeping score. Wisdom will certainly be given to those who ask. Basically, you lack wisdom, this is what you do. You ask God for it. It's that simple. And doesn't that make perfect sense? Because if we need the full picture, not just past experiences and past patterns that will give us an educated guess as to what wisdom will be, but we also need to know what's going to happen next, right? We don't have that information. Who does? Hmm. I think that would be God. God is the one who has the information of what happens next. So when we go to God and say, hey, I don't know what happens next. I don't know what to do in this decision. The best possible person to talk to about that is God because he does. If anyone lacks wisdom, he should go to God who gives generously to all without finding fault. That's a different version. It's the one that I memorized uh, as a kid. Without finding fault, he will get what God has given. That's a beautiful promise. So if you lack wisdom, all you have to do is go and ask God for it. Well, okay. How often do I get to ask God for it? And what kind of things can I ask God for wisdom for? It's a good question. The verse that we just read answered that question. But it's a good question because I think a lot of times we don't actually want to hear the, less, or hear the question or hear the answer to the question or we've heard it and we just haven't connected the dots. So let's say somebody out there is looking for a job change and wondering if they should stay with their job or if they should move to a different job. Um, what should they do? Well, they lack wisdom. They don't have all of the pieces to make that decision. So what they, should they do? Well, they should go to God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And we sit back with that, that person who's looking for a job and we go, you know, that's really smart. You should, you should go to God and talk to God about that because he's got it all planned out. He knows what's best talk to him and listen to what he has to say, that's, that's the smart thing to do. What happens if you need wisdom as to where to put your car keys when you get home so that you don't lose them? Is that something you should bring up to God and say, hey God, where's the best place to put my car keys? What about, you know, you get home and what's, What's the wisest thing to fix for supper tonight? Or you sit down and, and you get the clicker out and you ask and you're wondering, what's, what's the wisest thing that I should engage my brain with that's on TV right now? Or you get up in the morning and you look at your closet and you ask, what's the wisest thing that I could wear today? Now, I, I can see, you know, if, if we were in a group right now and, and I could see your faces, I would see that some of you are sitting there and just kind of shaking your car keys. What you're going to wear in the morning? What you're going to eat? Come on. We're not going to bother God with that kind of trivial stuff. God gave us a brain. We should use it, right? Exactly. You should use it in looking to God for what you should be doing. God helps those who help themselves, says the Bible. No, it doesn't. Benjamin Franklin said that. The Bible doesn't say that at all. What God says is that he wants to be so intimately connected with us that we are in constant conversation about what is the best possible way to live each and every moment of our lives. Each and every moment of our lives. You lack wisdom? Ask God. 
And this isn't like a genie thing where you get three wishes and then you're done. It's not how it works. God wants to be intimately involved in every aspect of your life, every moment of your life, for the rest of your life. And he is not put off by you asking about what the best thing is for breakfast in the morning. He's not put off by you asking these questions and, and talking with you about it and working through these kinds of things. He's not put off with that at all. He's not frustrated in the least bit when you ask for wisdom. Well, he's not frustrated if you're asking for wisdom in the right ways. I do believe that God does get frustrated sometimes when we ask for wisdom. I think one way that, that God gets frustrated when we ask for wisdom is when we are really not asking for wisdom. We're just asking for his blessing on something that we've already decided to do. You know that phone conversation that happens between a husband and wife? Let's, let's just kind of make this up here. Husband calls home and says, Hon, I really, really believe we need a new chainsaw, and I have, I'm looking at one right now that is on sale. It's a deal that we just can't pass up. And the wife says, chainsaw? What do we need a chainsaw for? What's wrong with the one that we've got? Why do we need a new chainsaw? Oh, this one is so much better, and it will do such a better job. And like I said, it's a steal. We should buy it. Well, but... What does that one do that ours doesn't already do? Well, I, I'm not sure about that, but it's a real deal. We should get it, hon. Uh, we should do it. And the wife pauses for a few moments and then realizes in the character of her husband and in his past behavior, she says, you already bought it, didn't you? And there is silence on the other end of the phone. You know what? We do that exact same thing with God a lot. And that's not asking for wisdom. That's just a very sophisticated way of asking for forgiveness, isn't it? We blew it. We ran, charged out there, and this is, what, this is what we want. And then we look for ways to make it something that sounds conceivable that it would be something that God wants. And this, I think, is one of those places where Christian knowledge becomes very dangerous and very difficult to work with. There are Christians out there who have a ton of Bible verses memorized, most of them completely out of context, but they have a ton of Bible verses memorized. And for those who don't have a ton of Bible verses memorized, they have this thing called Google on their phones, and they can just text, you know, type in a couple of words and type in the word verse after that, and they will get page after page after page of verses with that word in it. And they will find the verse that fits their category, and they go, oh, see, there, God said this is what I'm supposed to do. That's applying knowledge that's not necessarily applying wisdom. I know of myself that I know enough of the Bible that I can get the Bible to say anything I want it to say. I can twist verses. I can pull verses out of context. I can do, I can get that Bible to say anything that I want it to say. That does not make me wise. That makes me dangerous. There are many, many times through the course of the history of humanity, through the course of even our own individual lives, there are many, many times when we have pulled Bible verses out of the air, out of the context and said, this is what I'm supposed to do because somebody in the Old Testament did it. And we don't even know how it worked out in the Old Testament. In essence, we're telling God this is what he needs to do so that our actions look wise. I bet you that frustrates God. I bet you that frustrates God a ton. The other thing that I think frustrates God when we come to this whole wisdom thing 
<laughs> kind of look, my head's, are in, my head's in the clouds. Um, whoever asks shouldn't hesitate. They should ask in faith without doubting. Whoever doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed and turned by the wind. That person should never imagine that they will receive anything from the Lord. What does that look like? Well, when you ask God for something and he gives you an answer, that's not the time to question God's qualifications. That's not the time to wonder about God's motivations. And that is certainly not the time to start negotiating with God for your best interests. You go to God and say, what should I do? When he tells you this is what you should do, guess what you should do? What he told you to do. Don't mess around with this. Don't, don't mess with God on this. We all know the story. The guy falls over the cliff, grabs onto, grabs onto a root that's slowly pulling out of the and he knows that if the root gives or that if he, he lets go, he's going to fall to his death. So he hollers up to the top of the, top of the cliff and he says, is there anybody up there? And, and then he hears a voice back. Yes, this is Jesus. What can I do for you? And he says, I need help up. Can you help me up? And Jesus says, sure, let go. And then there's a long pause and the guy says, is there anybody else up there? That is the wrong answer when it comes to God. If you're going to ask for wisdom, you better do what God asks you to do. Now, even if what God asks you to do doesn't make sense. I look at some of the Old Testament prophets and some of the things that God asked them to do. Jeremiah knows that Nebuchadnezzar is coming. He's going to conquer Jerusalem. He's going to take everybody out, take everybody out to Babylon, and he's going to burn the city. And God tells Jeremiah, when Jeremiah says, I need some wisdom, I need to know what to do next, God tells Jeremiah to go buy a field. Hello, that field is going to be worthless in a matter of days, months, maybe a year. But it's not going to produce anything for Jeremiah. It's a total waste of his money. That doesn't sound very wise until you look at God's greater purpose and see the, the metaphor of what Jeremiah was saying or what God was saying through Jeremiah is that, yes, I'm sending you away, but this is still your home. I'm still invested in this territory. So in Jeremiah's day, that made no sense. But in God's bigger scheme of things, wow, what a beautiful message it sent. Not just to the people who were sent off to Babylon, but for generations to come. Even we benefit from the message of Jeremiah's obedience to God, even when it doesn't, didn't seem like the wise thing to do from Jeremiah's perspective. He did what God asked him to do because he recognized that God saw the whole picture, past, present, and even the future. When we ask God for wisdom, we can't be second-guessing God when he gives us an answer. We can't be negotiating with God when he gives us an answer. whole concept of Lord here comes hugely into play. You don't question the Lord. If the Lord says do it, you do it. If the Lord says don't do it, then you don't do it. Even if it's to your detriment, you do what the Lord tells you to do. And the beauty of it is that what God says is that he's never going to ask us to do something to our eternal detriment. 
He's got a plan. And if we want to act wisely, if we want to invest our resources, invest our time, invest our energy, invest ourselves into the best possible outcomes for ourselves, for others, and for the glory of God, then we have to seek God out for wisdom. The big question mark comes, though, how do you know that it's God talking? When you ask God for wisdom, and how do you know that it's God talking and not the pizza that you probably should have thrown out that you ate yesterday? How do you know that it's God? Well, I'm kind of glad you asked, because... James continues to answer this. Now, I'm going to jump way ahead of chapter 1, but James does answer this question. I call it the James 3.17 test. What is that? This is how it works for me. James 3.17 lists out a bunch of qualifications of how you know when when you're receiving wisdom from above. And so what I do when I got one of those places where I don't know what the future is and God hasn't necessarily been very clear with me on it up to this point, I need to seek his face on how to act or how to do this or what to do or what not to do. I begin by just putting this into God's hands and say, it's yours. I'm going to stop worrying about it. I'm going to stop fretting about it. I'm certainly going to stop trying to solve it. I'm going to let you have this And I am going to be still and know that you are God. And when you are ready to talk about it, you will talk with me about it. And then eventually, hopefully, I get some kind of response to that. Otherwise, I understand that that's not my problem. and I should probably just have let it go altogether. But when I do get that response, when I do get that sense of the Holy Spirit speaking, saying, this is the way I want you to proceed, I put it through what I call the James 3.17 test. What is that? What is wisdom from above? James writes, first it is pure, and then it is peaceful, gentle, and obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Do you see all of these different qualities here of the wisdom that comes from above? This is a beautiful thing that, that, that God gives us. When God speaks, or when I think it's God that's speaking, the first question I have to ask myself is, in what I, is what I'm hearing pure? Or is it contaminated with ulterior motives or, or, or undercuts or passive aggressivity that I want to get at somebody? Is this, is what I'm hearing something that is going to bring pure glory to God? If it doesn't pass that first test, then there's no need going further. If it all, if it boils down to this is all about me or all about my worries or my frustrations or or what I think should happen, if, if I in any way, shape, or form contaminate what I think God is speaking, then it's not God, it's me that's speaking. Then I move on. Is this peaceful? Am I going to create a riot out of this, or is there going to be peace at the end of it? Now, again, it's very important to remember that not everything we do is going to keep the peace. Sometimes God asks us, to make peace, which means we have to have some conversations that might not start out very peaceful, but the end goal is peaceful. This isn't about not rocking the boat. This is about allowing God's peace to take place through love and through truth. Is what what I receive from God, is it gentle? Or is it going to be something that I later look back and go, wow, that was a mistake. I really made an idiot of myself by blowing my top there. Um, Is it obedient? This is a huge one. Are there scripture passages that tell me that what I think God just told me, are there scripture passages that say that that is not what God would tell me to do? Am I obedient to the word of God with what I am hearing the Holy Spirit say? Is it filled with mercy? Is it filled with good actions when all this is all said and done? Are people going to look back at this? Am I going to look back at this and go, that ended up with good results? Is it fair? And is it genuine or sincere? Is it a peaceful piece of integrity? I run all of those things through them. And then I sit back and I ask God, did I get this right? And I wait for that peace to take place. 
Yes, this does take a little bit of time to work through, but that's okay. Because this is really about connecting with God rather than connecting all the dots in my little life and, and getting my to-do list done. Wisdom takes time. Because God doesn't always work on my timetable. Solomon put it this way. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. You lack wisdom? You're human. That's okay. What makes the difference between being okay and not okay is what you do with that lack of wisdom. Grab a book. Read it. Study it. Come up with a hundred different options and then pick the one that you like the best. Is that wisdom? No, not really. Not full wisdom. Now, certainly, that book right there might be helpful in your decision. It might give you knowledge that the Holy Spirit can use in guiding you in wisdom. But you want real wisdom? You want the full picture? You have to know the outcome before you make your move. And the only way to do that is to seek the one who knows the outcome already. There's a lot of places in our world right now, in our lives right now, where wisdom would be extraordinarily helpful, wouldn't it? How do I do this? What do I do here? How do I move forward? Do I move forward? C.S. Lewis tells us that sometimes progress is realizing that you've made the wrong turn and you turn around and go back. When, when do we need to do that? How do we know what the, right, what the real right answer is? If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and he shall know that he has what he's asked. But when he asks, he must, not, he must believe and not doubt, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not believe that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Need wisdom? Ask for wisdom. But when wisdom is bestowed, the wisest thing to do is to do it. Yes, it takes faith. And yes, you won't get it right all the time. That's why this is a journey and not a diploma. My prayer for you is that as you work through your life, as you work through the decisions you have to make even today, that that spirit of anxiety that, that makes you feel like, you know, I'm losing control. I, I pray that in those, in those moments, the Holy Spirit would draw you to just take a deep breath and go, wait a minute. I don't know the outcome of that. I don't know the outcome. I don't know the right decision. I don't know the best decision. I don't know what the wisest thing to do is here. And that's okay. Because God does. And God has promised me that if I seek his face, I will find it. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for being so patient with us, so loving and so kind. You are an amazing God. Thank you so much for all the times that you have guided and directed us, 
even the times in which we didn't ask for wisdom and you supplied it, thank you. Great is your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, I do ask that as we move through the rest of today, as we move through the rest of our life, that you would gently nudge us when we mistake knowledge for wisdom, when we mistake us for you. And we think we've got it all figured out. We don't need any help. Remind us gently that you hold the patent on wisdom. And we don't even know how to make it work. And in so doing, help us to live in your wisdom as we live continuously connected to you. And may we enjoy that journey. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the day.